Korea's got an incredible semiconductor industry, very strong, um, and uh, uh, continues to be vibrant. I think what's happened in the industry, if you look at the cycles, the computer industry, if you go back to the 70s and early 80s, it was very vertically or IBM did everything. They did everything from building semiconductors to building their own hard disks to building the operating system to building the applications. They did everything. And then what happened was we went through this PC period where the industry became horizontally organized. Intel built the chips, Microsoft built the operating system, Oracle and others built the applications, along came the internet and sat on top of that. I think in order to get progress now, we have to reintegrate on this vertical stack. And that's causing a reintegration of the companies and a rethinking, which is why, for example, Google builds a, a machine learning chip, because they have the knowledge to do it. Um, and of course, you also have players like uh, TSMC playing a, a key role as a foundry service, which when we started MIPS, there were no foundries. It was, it was one of the difficult things. There was no such thing as a fabulous semiconductor company. Now, fabulous semiconductor companies like NVIDIA uh, rule the world. Um, so it's, it's, the industry has gone through this tremendous change. Um, but I think it's actually liberated them to get more creativity and bring more innovation uh, into the space. You know, now the cloud computing, uh, big data, AI, and digital transformation has become the foundation of everything. How can these technologies uh, can be used to deal with the COVID-19 and the climate change problems? So the big advantage of these technologies is their ability to look at extremely complex data and discover relationships. So for example, I think some of the opportunities in, in the COVID-19 space are probably in things like drug discovery, where we can use uh, machine learning to recognize complex patterns, uh, how proteins fold and structure themselves, um, to discover, for example, to do a search from, we have lots of drugs. Some of them might actually be useful against COVID-19. Can we find a structured way to use machine learning to search the existing drugs that have gone through clinical trials? We know they're safe for people. Can we find a, a, an intelligent way to search those and find out if any of them might be useful uh, for, treating, for treating this new uh, virus? Uh, similarly, I think in, in climate change, um, we can use the technology both to search for radical breakthroughs in energy technologies that will be more green, more um, beneficial for the Earth. Uh, we can also use it to understand what's happening in the Earth dynamic. Uh, modeling the Earth, it's extremely complex. It's chaotic. Trying to model it with strictly deterministic mathematical models is just too hard mm. a problem because of chaos theory. Uh, so can we use AI techniques to determine what the long-term trajectory looks like and predict where we might be in another, in another 10 years. Right now, there is an explosion of interest in AI and in machine learning and deep learning in particular. There's not enough ta talent out there yet to satisfy all the demand from not only things like drug discovery, but the financial markets, um, lots of business intelligence markets that are exploding. We've got to build a lot more people in the AI space mm -hmm. that understand how to use this technology. And that's why the work you're doing on the new Data Science Institute is particularly important, mm -hmm. because there's a dramatic talent shortage. Uh, I, I think um, some of that talent may end up in the pharmaceutical. Some of it may end up in the financial sector. Um, but I think we hope to keep enough core technology there that we can continue the basic technology development which will be critical. We're not, we're not close to done with the basic technology development yet. We're, in the, we're really in the infancy of AI. It took, it took 50 years to get mm -hmm. AI born mm -hmm. with the great, at, when, they, when the AlphaGo uh, beat the world's Go champion there in South Korea, that was the turning point. Mm -hmm. That took 50 or 60 years to get to. But we're still just in the beginning phase of seeing this technology mature. Mm -hmm. 
Now, U.S. is the far the best leader in this AI and the related technologies, you know. And China has been catching up, well, U.S. fast with its own market scale and its own, you know, unique market control mechanism uh, with one party system. You know, 15 years ago, Tom Friedman said that the internet makes the world flat. Now we are seeing that the reversal of this trend. Unfortunately, the world is being divided by U.S.-China collision. How do you see this division affect the global business, the global innovation system like Silicon Valley, and the education system? Well, I, mean, I think you're right. I think we, we are coming to a potential um, divide in the road, which we've already begun to see. Whether or not there is a strategy going forward, um, it, it's hard to see right now because there's a collision of interests both in the commercial sector, which I would say in the commercial sector, we're better off just competing against and competing for and trying to bring the best talent to bear. But it overlaps into the national security sector as well. And that creates a whole different overlay over the problem, brings government even more into the picture in terms of saying what can and can't be done. And there are real, uh, there are serious national uh, security concerns. I don't think we can brush these aside and say um, these are not real concerns. Uh, it is not hard for somebody to put something into a piece of hardware that becomes a backdoor, a trap door that can leak information, and you and I can never discover it. Never, we'd never find it. We could search and search and search and search, we'd never find it. So that, that, that creates a real exposure. Um, and I think we're going to have to either decide that we're going to work together and make agreements which prevent that kind of thing from happening, or we're going to fracture the market. Um, now, the world could have two markets. It could have a market in China, um, maybe North Korea, a few other places, and it could have a market of the rest of the world, mm -hmm. the free world, so to speak. Yeah, we could end up there. It wouldn't be a disaster. Each one of those markets is big enough to support itself. It will slow things, slow the pace of technology down a little bit. Um, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an impossible situation if that's where we end up. Uh, what did you do to make Stanford and the Silicon Valley grow together? Well, we, we've always had a symbiotic relationship dating back to Hewlett and Packard, which is now 75 years ago, the start of sort of the first uh, Stanford spin out. Um, we, but we, the university has always seen itself both as a talent magnet, but also it attracted people who were interested in possibly becoming entrepreneurs after they did their research. Because it was a very easy place. It was easy to take a leave of absence, license the technology and go, uh, and go do a startup, and then come back to the university and, and re-engage. And we've had a lot of faculty that did that. And when they came back to the university, they brought so much experience from starting a company and being an industry. They could give new insights to, and they could coach younger students who might be thinking they'd like to do that as well. So we built up role models. We tried to make it easy. Um, one of the great things about the Valley and Stanford or Berkeley for that matter is that industry and university, they respect one another. They do different things, and everybody understands that universities and industry are on different time scales and have different focal lengths. But they respect the work that goes on, and that it makes it possible for them to collaborate and interact in important ways. How do you see the education has to change? Uh, most universities you know, in the world suffer from uh, rigid silo structures and fail to accommodate the fast change of the world. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it, um, getting universities to change requires that you build a long-term plan to get them, because they're going to change slowly. Uh, we have tenured faculty, there's slow turnover. It, one of the things we do at Stanford is we hire 
the vast majority of the faculty we hire are young faculty, just out of their PhD or a postdoc. Um, we look for people who are in fields that we see as growing in importance to hire. Um, and we often, we often try to put them in a disruptive situation where they'll help, help bring the department along into the new age. And we really empower those young people um, because we believe that often the very best idea is going to come from a young 35-year-old faculty member, not necessarily from the great wise older faculty member. Sometimes the real, the, many of the breakthroughs come from those, particularly in the technology and science fields. So we keep trying to innovate in that way and renew ourselves. Um, we like to say, in a university, every day should be a first day. The World Knowledge Forum.